Hey guys, welcome to the Sunday School. Let's do the announcements first and foremost. One is that we have fellowship tonight. Uh, as always, I will tell you that if you have COVID symptoms, or symptoms of any illness for that matter, uh, don't come to fellowship. But if you don't, come on to fellowship. It's at my house uh, at uh, 7.15, 7 to 7.15-ish is when we start. We try to be done by 8.30. We're talking about relationships, is our, and we, we'll sing, we'll eat, we'll sing, uh, we'll talk about relationships. I think we're having, I think it's going to be another Welcome to Mo's Night tonight, Welcome so you might want to come for that. And then uh, the second thing is, is that we are slowly rolling out small groups. Uh, our, our goal is by the end of this month to have everyone in a small group that meets uh, weekly. And, our, and we've, begin, we've begun to do that. Whether your small group meets in the morning or in the evenings, uh, we're working on that as we speak, slowly rolling that out. Uh, the last thing is, uh, this, is a, this video is also available on YouTube. Uh, if you've found it via Instagram or if you've heard someone say, well, I'd like to tune to Sunday School, but I don't have an Instagram, uh, you can also find this video on YouTube under Trinity Montgomery uh, under their YouTube page. So you can find that there. This is our fourth, third, third uh, pre-recorded Sunday School. Uh, we are the second time that we're in Genesis. We're going through the Old Testament, uh, hitting the highlights. We're doing a survey. That's what an Old Testament survey means. But uh, we're going to spend a little time early on because the first... Uh, the first bit of Genesis is so fundamental to everything else that's going to happen that we study in the Old Testament. So we're going to spend a little time here. So this morning we're going to look at uh, how God made man. Uh, we sort of looked at creation uh, the first week, Genesis 1, 1 through 5. And today we're going to look at a couple of passages in Genesis 1 and in Genesis 2 about God's creation of men and women uh, on the sixth day and why that's so important. So we're going to jump into it now. Thanks for joining us. If you have your Bibles, uh, you can turn to Genesis chapter 1. There's a lot. We're going to be quoting several scriptures in here. I'm going to put a couple of them up. But where we want to start today is what does it mean to be God's image bearer? What does it mean that God made man in His image? And that's not a phrase that I made up or that anyone made up, we find that in Scripture itself. So if you'll look in Genesis 1, verse 27, it says this, uh, So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And earlier, just one verse earlier in Genesis 126, it says, Then God said, Let us make man in our image. So uh, over and over again, you see uh, that uh, man has a special place, and we're going to come back to that when it comes to creation, that God has been created and creating, and He's created uh, light and dark, night and day. He's created uh, the sky, the seas, the dry land, the plants, the animals, the fish, the birds. He's, done all, he's created all these different things, right? But that, uh, that what makes man specifically important in this story, right, is that, he, that man is made in God's image. Uh, that we are made in God's image. Now, what does it mean to be made in God's image? Does it mean that God looks like us? That God has arms and legs and walks around on you know two feet? No, not necessarily. That's not what it means. In fact, if you just give a cursory reading of uh, the Old Testament and the New Testament, I think what you'll find is uh, you be might, you might be surprised at how little there are physical descriptions or how how seldom. There are physical descriptions of people in the Bible. Now, we know that, for instance, that Saul was tall, right? And we know uh, that David was ruddy. That might have mean, meant that he had reddish hair. I'm not even sure what that means, just to be honest. I've never been, I've never been given a good definition of that. So, uh, you know, sometimes we are given physical descriptions of people. Like Goliath, for instance, we know that he was a giant. But most of the time, you know, what did Moses look like? What were his height and weight in 40 time? You know, we don't know. You know, what, what, uh, what did Abraham look like uh, or Sarah or Ruth? We don't know, right? We're not given physical descriptions. Instead, the way that the Bible often describes people is by what they say and what they do. That's how we're supposed to derive what they were like is their character, honestly, what they say and what they do. And we shouldn't be surprised by that. Because when God introduce, introduces himself to us in the scriptures, what do we see him doing? We see him speaking, 
you know, things into existence, creating ex nihilo, but we also see him doing, creating. So we know God by what he says and what he does. That's how he reveals himself to us. And oftentimes that is how we know the people in the Bible uh, is that they are, they reveal themselves to us and their character by what they say and by what they do. And so what does it mean to be made in God's image? It means that we are to do what God does. Uh, in fact, if you look at the next verse, Genesis 1.28, right after uh, it says, so God created man in his own image, 128 says this, And God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth. So here we see God saying that man is made in our image. And you know what does that mean? It means that we do what God does. We saw in creation that God, we talked about this, we talked about this a bunch actually, uh, but we see in creation that God separates, right? He orders. He orders the chaos. And then also he fills the emptiness. And so those are the very things that he commands um, Adam and Eve to do. He says uh, to fill the earth and subdue it, right? And have dominion over it. So in other words, to bring a meaning to the emptiness and to bring order to the chaos. That's what we're made to do. We're made to do what God does. And that's what it means to be made in God's image. It doesn't mean that we look like God, right? It means that we do what God does. And not only that, but as you'll notice in verse uh, 127, it says, uh, again, it's the last part of that verse says, male and female, he created them. And this is not going to be a lesson on gender per se, but I think it's port- important to realize that not only are we made in God's image and not only are we made to do the things that God does, but we're also made to complement one another, that neither man nor woman is in totality God's image, but that together we form God's image. This is why uh, the institution of marriage is so important for Paul, uh, you know, as it's a a picture of Christ in the church, that uh, it's very easy to think, you know, um, you know, that your gender is the best gender, and why are the other, why is the other gender so weird, right? Why do girls have to be the way that they are, you know, or you know, why are boys always, you know, this or that? Like, it's very easy to, uh, to uh, sanctify the things that you are and to vilify the things that you aren't, right? And that, there's a lot of uh, consternation and a lot of problems because of that. But what Genesis lays out for us pre-sin is that man and woman were made to live together. We're made to be together. We're supposed to be together. And that each one, and that we complement one another, where in, in some areas women are stronger and in other areas men are stronger, and that those strengths and those weaknesses complement one another. And I just want you to see that there, is that, is that God created uh, man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. A uh, last thing on this first point about being made in God's image, and that's this, is that we are made to rule as God's steward. If you look in 129, it says, Behold, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is on the face of all the earth, and every tree with seed and its fruit. You shall have them for food. And to every beast, this is verse 30 of the earth, and to every bird of the heavens, and so on and so on. One of the things that uh, that is clear from the Scriptures is that man is made to rule. That This creation is not our creation. The world is not our world. Alabama is not our state. Montgomery is not our city. That everything that we have is given from God, and we're made to be his stewards, right? And so we have a special place in creation. We are different from other creatures. We're not like animals. We're not like plants. Because we're made in God's image, we are over them. Um, they, we are... Uh, they're in charge of them, right? And that doesn't give us the right to abuse those things, to abuse the earth with pollution and littering, or, and it doesn't give us the right to abuse animals or to, um, or to abuse, uh, you know, natural resources. That's not what that says. In fact, it says we, you know, we've talked about that in our apologetics class. Is that we ought to be uh, actively pursuing. Uh, the right dominion over animals and plants and nature, right? And so I I guess what I wanted to say here to close out this point is that we're different from animals, plants, you know, uh, from creation. We are different because we're made in God's image. That there is a value, an importance, a significance that's placed on every human that's different than anything else in creation. So our first point is we're made in God's image and that matters. Okay, the next thing I want you to see uh, it happens in the next chapter, in Genesis chapter 2. We've looked at Genesis 1.27, basically through 1.31. But I want you to see in Genesis chapter 2, verse 2, 
Uh, just this very simple passage. It says this, And on the seventh day God finished His work that He had done, and He rested on the seventh day from all His work that He had done. So God blessed the seventh day and made it holy, because on it God rested from all His work that He had done in creation. And I just want you to see that that Sabbath pattern is here before the fall. That idea of working six, resting one. This is an idea that we talked about when we talked about work in our apologetic series. Uh, I think that was actually our first one to go on YouTube. These videos are on YouTube now too, not just on Instagram. But I think that was our first one was our apologetic about uh, how does our faith inform the way we view work. And uh, we talked a lot about God's pattern of six and one and how that's different from the pattern that we live in, which is a five-two pattern. And uh, but that God, even before the fall, indicated that 6-1 should be our pattern. And that it says something about God that He would give us this good creation. It also says something about God that He would tell us to take a break from our work and trust in Him. I just wanted you to see that uh, very quickly, is that right here before the fall, that 6-1 pattern is established by God, and that's something that we should be paying attention to. Okay, so what happens between Genesis 1 and Genesis 2? This has been uh, the topic of a conversation let me tell you a scenario that you might find yourself in in a few years. You go to college. You've got to take some electives. Maybe you'll take Old Testament or New Testament as an elective. And maybe you're at Auburn or Alabama or who knows where you are, right? And uh, maybe you're at Mississippi State, which, by the way, I've got this thing hidden back here for a reason. Uh, but wherever you are, uh, you're going to take a class and... You're probably going to take if you take if you haven't taken a New Testament or Old Testament class, uh, what you're going to hear, especially about the Old Testament, is that it was a the Old Testament was not written you know as it describes to be written that it's written by several different sources and some of the evidence for that is Genesis one and Genesis two that they're two creation accounts. Uh, that's not true, by the way. Uh, <laughs> what we have here between Genesis one and Genesis two is a Genesis 1 is a story of all of creation, the first seven days of creation. But Genesis 2 is kind of like scoping in, right? You know, you can look out in the field and you can see the deer maybe that you're hunting. But when you look through the scope, it narrows your focus, right? You can't see everything that you could see when you weren't looking through the scope. But what you can see, you can see very clearly. And that's what happens here, is that uh, we scope in, the author scoped of Genesis scopes in on the creation of man because it's so integral to everything that's going to happen from here on out. He scopes in, he focuses in on God creating man. And I want you to notice a few things that happens. Look in, uh, first of all, Genesis 2 chapter 4 says this, These are the generations of the heavens and the earth when they were created. In the days of the Lord God made the earth and the heavens. So here there's like a narrative break in Genesis where he says, Okay, we're going to focus in on this. And then I want you to see in verse 7, verse 7 of, ch of chapter 2, it says this, then the Lord God formed the man of the dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living creature. Now, I just think this is very interesting and important to note. You know, how people behave is important. If you read uh, the passage in John 7 and 8 about Jesus dealing with uh, the woman who was caught in adultery, one of the things that comes out that's very interesting is that Jesus, by his, just his mere body language, uh, shows his contempt for the accusers and his grace and mercy toward the accused. Uh, when the accusers bring this woman caught in adultery, uh, Jesus kneels down with a stick or with his finger and draws in the dirt, right? And then when they, when they leave, when he answers them and says, he who is without sin should cast the first stone, and they left from the oldest to the youngest, uh, when he basically disarms their trap, He's left with just this woman in front of him. And uh, he looks at, he stands up, he quits doodling in the ground or, you know, first century texting or whatever that is. He, uh, he quits doing that and he looks at that woman in the face and he says, uh, who here is, who is here to condemn you? And, you know, so how people act is just as important as what they do, you know. Um, and here what I want you to see in Genesis chapter 2 is how differently God creates man versus how he created everything else, right? How does God create everything else in creation? He does it by the word of his power. In other words, he speaks it ex nihilo, from nothing into existence. God says light and there is light, right? He creates light by his mere word. That's not what happens here, and that's important. Did you, did you look? You might want to look again in Genesis chapter 2, verse 7. It says, then, then the Lord God formed the man formed the man of the dust from the ground and breathed 
breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. Do you see like the personal and kind of craftsman way in which God creates us? That there's something, because we're made in his image, right? He, it's a personal thing that God does here when he creates Adam and Eve. He, he creates them personally. We're, you could say that we're handmade. You know, the most expensive cars in the world, like a Rolls Royce, it's a handmade car. It's completely custom built. It's, you know, exorbitantly expensive. I remember one time we were driving to church on um, uh, Sunday morning and we pulled out onto uh, Zelda and we just happened to pull out beside a Rolls Royce. And I remember telling Campbell, the Rolls Royce pulled into McDonald's. Now, I have no idea why someone who has a Rolls Royce is eating at McDonald's. That's for another day or time. But uh, I actually pulled in through the McDonald's parking lot and showed Campbell the car. I was like, that's the most expensive car you're probably ever going to see, right? And the reason that Rolls Royces are so expensive is because they're custom made. They're handmade. And uh, there's an element of craftsmanship and care and personal personalization, and this is not a commercial for Rolls Royce in any way, shape, or form. I just want you to see that that kind of personal care and craftsmanship is what we see here in Genesis chapter 2 about how we were made, how man was made. That man is not made, man was made in a special way, and that means something, right? It means, we're going to come back to this in the takeaways, but what it means is, is that every person that you meet is created by God. Every person that you meet is fearfully and wonderfully made. And that matters, right? Whether you really like that person and want to spend a lot of time with them or whether you don't like this person and don't want to spend time with them, that doesn't matter. Both of those people are made in God's image. They're fearfully and wonderfully made. So I just want you to see that there's this kind of special situation here, a personal touch that God does when He creates man, and that's important. It says a lot about what we believe about mankind. Okay, finally, what I want you to see is uh, happens in Genesis 2, ver- chapter 2, verse 9. It says this, And out of the ground the Lord God made up to spring every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life was in the midst of the garden, and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Now, it can be kind of frustrating to, uh, to read Genesis, right? Uh, because you know, especially when you start reading about the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, because you know what's going to happen. I don't know if you've ever thought back in your mind about uh, a, a, t- a game that your team has lost, and like, oh man, if we had just done this one thing differently, we probably would have won. There's maybe a team that you follow, or maybe maybe it's even a game that you played in. Like, if maybe if I hadn't fumbled, or maybe if I hadn't uh, missed that tackle, or maybe if I hadn't messed up that serve, or if I just you know, done this or that, and you can kind of, uh, you know, play in the game back in your mind. You can kind of put yourself in knots about a lot of things uh, like that with regret. And oftentimes, maybe you feel that way when you read Genesis. You know, you say to yourself, why did God have to put the tree of the knowledge of good and evil in the garden like that? That doesn't make any sense. If he had just not put that in there, then there wouldn't have been any reason for Adam and Eve to fall and everything would have been fine. Why would he do that, right? And, you know, I understand why you might think that way. I think it's important for us to realize the kind of freedom that God gives us. The kind of freedom that God gives us is not complete autonomy. In other words, that we can just do whatever we want. That every freedom that we have from God, every freedom that we've ever experienced is a limited freedom. In other words, there is a limit to the freedom. Uh, Think about driving in a car, right? You drive in a car and you only ever use half the road, right? You only ever use, think about a two-lane road, you're only going to use 50% of the road at any given moment in the, in the car. You're only, and why is that? You're limiting yourself so that you can freely travel and safely travel on the road, right? You, you've limited your use of the road to a certain section of it, and you're not going to use another section. But by limiting yourself, you're actually gaining freedom. And uh, every freedom that we have is like this. Every freedom that we have comes from God. Everything that we have comes from God. And the tree of the knowledge of good and evil is a reminder, not only of obedience, that we owe our obedience to God, but that we don't know everything that God knows, that we are not God. If we want to categorize what sin is in a very simple way, one thing we might say is us trying to be God. In other words, us trying to alleviate ourselves or make ourselves free of God. And that's exactly what the tree of the knowledge of good and evil represents. In fact, we talked previously about what a merism is. It's a literary device where you use two ends to describe everything, like God made the heavens and the earth, right, and everything in between. In many ways, the the tree of the knowledge of good and evil could be called the tree of the knowledge of everything, right? It's the good and evil and everything in between. And that by taking of that tree, which we're going to look at next week, what Adam and Eve are doing is saying that they don't need God, that they can do things on their own. 
if you take a goldfish out of its bowl, you have liberated it from its bowl, right? You've set it free. But if you just set it down on the ground, is it free? No. It has to be in water in order for it to be a real goldfish, right? To, to live its ultimate goldfish life. To find its fulfillment and meaning as a goldfish, it needs to be in water. It needs to be limited, right? Its freedom is, is tied to a limitation, and all of our freedom is like that. All freedom is tied to a limitation. One of the uh, key aspects of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and the tree of life is that it's a constant reminder in the center of the garden to Adam and Eve that God is there. So even if God is not physically present with them, it's a reminder to them, right? A reminder that everything that they see and everything that they're doing, they're doing on God's behalf. So when we think about the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and the tree of life, we want to remember, we can even be as bold as to say that those are like the first sacraments, right? They're the first reminders that we owe everything to God. Just like the Lord's Supper and baptism are reminders of, of what we owe to God. Uh, they're more than that, obviously, but they also are reminders of what we owe to God. We could say that about the tree of knowledge, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and the tree of life, is that those are the first sacraments, the first reminders of everything that Adam and Eve owe to God. Okay. So what are our takeaways from this Sunday School lesson? The first one is this, is that all people are made in God's image, and that matters. All people are made in God's image, and it matters. Uh, you are made for relationship. Remember that God said it's not good for the man to be alone. That's why God created woman, right? Is that man and woman, they can't exist on their own. They need each other, right? And we are made to have relationships with each other, and we're also made to have a relationship with God. And that's true for you and it's also true for everyone that you meet, that everyone you meet is an image bearer of God, made to have relationships and made to have a relationship with Him, a relationship with others and a relationship with Him. And it's important. that's an important theological point. And a, a, we would call that doctrine. And that might sound boring, but it's important because it has a, a huge impact on the way in which we deal uh, with everyone in our lives, with our family members, with our bosses, with our employees, with our enemies, with our friends, with our opponents on the field, if we truly recognize with the people who are political adversaries or, you know, on the other side of the aisle, as they call it, uh, no matter what, if we truly believe that they are made in God's image, made for relationships with, with us and other people, and also made for relationship with Him, that changes the way that we view them. In fact, I think C.S. Lewis said that every person you meet is an eternal being is an eternal being that's going to live on in eternity forever. And whether that eternity is you know, an eternity with God or without Him, it doesn't matter. They are eternal. You know, that's, a, that's a very different way to look at the person who sits next to you in geometry class. The second thing is that God gives us freedom, but it's always restricted. Uh, and this will be our last point. Uh, what, this is a great quote from G.K. Chesterton. Um, he's a British... Uh, He's a British uh, theologian. He's a, he's a lot of things, actually. But uh, he said this. He says, The more that I consider Christianity, the more I found that while it had established a rule and order, the chief aim of that order was to give room for good things to run wild. Uh, there's a great study of, uh, of playgrounds. They built playgrounds and... Uh, and, and they did study on how the playgrounds were used. And they would use the same playground every time, but the, the variable would be sometimes there would be a fence around the playground and sometimes there wouldn't. When there was not a fence around the playground, they looked at the heat maps of where the children congregated. And all the children stayed on the very central apparatus most of the time. They did not, they did not venture out to the outside of the playground. But when they put a fence around the playground, then all of a sudden the heat map looked completely different and children felt the freedom to go wherever they are. And that's just another illustration about how uh, God limits us and our limits actually allow us to live free, right? To live in freedom. So uh, the two points I wanted to make uh, with this lesson is one, we're made in God's image and that matters. And two, that God gives us freedom, but it's always limited because it comes from Him. That we're created beings, and so our freedom comes from Him, and so it will always be limited. I think in short, what we want to say about the freedom that God provides in the garden is that there is no freedom outside of Him. Uh, in fact, uh, that's the lie that uh, we believe in our sin, is that we can achieve freedom by separating ourselves from God. When in fact, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and the tree of life are constant reminders that the only real freedom is found in Christ, in God alone. Okay, well, I hope you got something out of this Sunday School lesson and that you enjoyed it, and I appreciate you watching, and uh, we'll talk to you later.